Thank you very much. Hello, thank you for having me today. I am excited to talk to so many people. I'm a little nervous too. It was like five people here before and I was like, oh, I got this. And now there's a lot of you, but um, just let me know if you can't hear me in the back. Hi, Adam. Um, but let's get right to it because I've got a lot of information I want to share and we have a short period of time. So I will have to move through it kind of quickly, but we will have time for Q&A at the end of the session and I'm also not running away. So I'll be around. If you have any questions, you can find me all day. So. Today, these are the slides, if you want to jot this down real quick, if you want to download the slides, I'll show it again at the end. I do have to keep moving, so one more second on that, and I'll show it again at the end. So, and really quickly, some fun facts about me. I'm a lifelong nerd, started playing with code on a Commodore 64 when I was six, started building websites in HTML in 1997, been working at SEO professionally since 2005, now an SEO agency owner of Payman Marketing and Stealth Search and Analytics, both specialize in SEO and PPC. Pam and Marketing works directly with clients and Stealth works with agencies on a private label basis. And fun fact, I'm a not so closet metalhead. Some people know that about me already. Yes, favorite bands include Kill Switch Engage, Fear Factory, and of course, Slayer. Anyway, <laughs> first and foremost, this is what we're not going to learn how to do today. A lot of people, when they think of writing for search engines or writing for SEO, this is what they think of, and this is what some people do. This is what you should not, 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 not ever do. That really doesn't need much more explanation. You can, you can see why that looks awful for humans, and even search engines don't like this nowadays. So we'll go over what you should do. This is the formula for success. I know you can't see every step there, but this is what we're going to go over today step by step. So we will go through each piece, and I'll reiterate it again at the end. But first of all, let's touch upon who you're writing for. Your website really has two audiences, right? Human and search engines. So what do humans want to see out of your content? Humans want high quality advice, natural sounding language, and short digestible snippets of information that they can skim through, read through quickly. Now what do search engines want from your content? They want high quality advice, so that's the same. Natural sounding language, also the same. And here's where it differs. Search engines like long length, thousands of words. The average page one ranking has 1,890 words. The, actually, the, that, so that's the average. The most likely to get you ranked on the first page is actually between 2,250 words and 2,500 words. So that's where humans and search engines really differ and want pretty much exact opposite things. So how do you compromise with that? It can be done. First, you want to pick a specific number of points about your topic that you're going to make. Next, you want to write thoroughly about each point, but break it up with subheadings for each point that you're making so it can be easily skimmed and digested and include visuals throughout, you know, a lot of imagery. So you can really get to a pretty high word count without it looking like a practical term paper. If you use those subheadings and those visuals to break it up, it's still skimmable and easily digestible for your humans and you've got your word count for your search engines. So that, that balance can be struck. And not every single piece of content needs to be that long. That will make it more likely that your content will be favored by search engines, but you, you know, other lengths of content do rank as well. So, and sometimes it's simply not appropriate to write 2,500 words, especially if it's like a product description or something on an e-commerce site. So just when you can go, you know, fit in as many words as you can and make it, make that compromise by breaking it up with subheadings and imagery. Couple more things to keep in mind when writing for your human audience. Like we said, we want to provide high quality advice in natural sounding copy. We're going to break down with subtitles. And here's one thing unique to humans is to use catchy titles. What do I mean by catchy titles or how to make your titles catchy? One of the most effective possible tactics for this, you're probably aware of this already, is to put the quantity of points you're making in the title. So like top five marketing strategies for success. That number, it's, just, it's weird. It's, it really increases click through a lot having that number in there. Another way you can make your titles catchy is to add a sense of urgency or exclusivity. So like there are only three ways to increase online sales. That immediately makes me want to click on that. I'm like, I want to know, I want to know what they are. So exclusivity and urgency work. 
identifying your audience. If you're writing an article for, say, contractors, you actually say contractors in the title. If I'm a contractor, I'll immediately identify with that, be more likely to read it. And include the result of your advice in the title, the, the WIFM, the what's in it for them. Like increase online sales is an example of this. You know, what are you going to get out of reading this article? You're going to get advice on how to increase online sales. You're like, I want to increase online sales. And use powerful words. Here's some examples of some general powerful words. Some of these are a little, you know, clickbaity, like shocking, but there's plenty of good ones that are not, you know, that either. Essential is one of my favorites, you know, top five essential tips for achieving X result or so on. So including power words in the title is helpful as well. So all that will help attract more human readers to your content. But actually, if, if you get more human readers to your content, your content will have more click through and engagement metrics on the search engines and the search engines will see that. So it is kind of a benefit to, from an SEO perspective as well. So a couple of things to keep in mind when writing for search engines. You want to give thorough advice so that word count is high, as we mentioned. Naturally incorporate right-sized keywords that people actually search for. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by right-sized right now. When I talk about right-sized keywords, I'm talking about using a keyword research tool to pick phrases that have a search volume at or below your site's monthly organic traffic number. The rationale behind this is that if search engines were already willing to rank your site for phrases that have a really large search volume, your traffic would probably already be pretty large. So you kind of need to right size the amount of traffic they're willing to drive to you right now and the volume of the keyword. This is not an exact science, but it's, it's you know, it, we found that it works. If you want to write for a term, a keyword term, that's searched 90,000 times a month, but your site only gets 500 hits a month of traffic, search engines are not likely to trust you that much for that popular of a phrase yet. So hope that makes sense. So to find out your monthly organic search number, you can go into Google Analytics, click on acquisition, then all traffic, then channels, set your date range to last 30 days, or if you have a seasonal business and you know December was the last 30 days and it was slow, maybe just pick a different whole calendar month and then take note of your organic search number. Then you go to your keyword research tool and there are a lot of keyword research tools out there, but this is the one that is our favorite. It's called Keyword Tool. It's found at keywordtool.io. Yeah, it's a pretty self-explanatory name. <laughs> and it, it is a paid tool. Uh, the plans range from $48 to $88 a month. If you do a lot of writing, I think it's totally worth every penny. There are other options out there that will give you some data for free, usually partial data for free, like SEMrush will give you, uh, I think, five to 10 keyword stats for free. SEMrush is very good, but I like this one in particular because this uses Google's search volume data. SEMrush and some other tools use their own database, and I like to get the information straight from the source. So I like that this one uses Google's search data. So once you have your keyword research tool handy, you want to pick a primary keyword for each piece of content that you're writing. Like I said, with a search volume at or below your monthly organic traffic number, it's okay to go below. The goal is not to go too high because then you're just, that keyword's kind of out of reach to your site at this time. Hopefully you build up your traffic slowly over time and bigger keywords come within reach. So for example, if I wanted to write an article about AC compressor failure for an HVAC company, who has 500 hits of search traffic a month, this search volume of 90 means that's, that's attainable for that site. You also want to pick a few secondary supporting keywords too. Google's very focused on AI and machine knowledge right now, and they, they're trying to really understand context a lot. So you can't just take one keyword and only use that keyword about that topic throughout the content. You need to pick secondary supporting keywords as well to flesh out that context. So in the keyword research tool, you can find a couple of examples of uh, a couple of secondaries. For example, symptoms of AC compressor failure or causes of AC compressor failure, if AC compressor failure is the primary. You can and should also look at Google Search Suggest for ideas for secondaries. This is a, a direct clue into what Google thinks is contextual for that topic. So punch in your primary keyword in Google and just see what the other 
secondary, you know, what the search suggest keywords come up, and those are good contenders for secondaries. One final tip before you finalize your primary phrase or even the secondaries is to Google each one of them and make sure that Google understands the context of the topic correctly the same way that you do. You'd be surprised sometimes you type something you think is so simple, so straightforward into Google and you get results for something else entirely. I, I forget what the primary keyword was once, but I was checking something. It was business related, technology related or something. And there was results about farming in Google. I'm like, okay, that's not, uh, you know, Google and I are not seeing eye to eye on this, so got to go in a different direction. All right, so back to that formula for success. We're now going to go through examples of each step, and then I'll reiterate each step one last time. So the, the first step is actually to pick the keyword. We went over that. Next step, you want to use your primary keyword in the title and in the opening paragraph or opening section of body copy. Easy enough, doesn't really require further explanation. Next up, this makes it really easy to use your primary keyword throughout and have it sound natural. You want to do a quick summary, and this is both for humans and search engines, quick summary of the points, the key points that you're going to make in the article. Just in this article, you're going to learn da, 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 about this topic and include your primary keyword in the subheading for that quick roundup, and it sounds perfectly natural. Next up, you break down each point, write thoroughly about each point, but break it up with those subheadings. Include the primary keyword naturally and include the secondary keywords also naturally, at least one each for the secondaries. And then you want to use your primary keyword in your conclusion subheading and in your conclusion paragraph. So here's you know, your key takeaway in the subheading and here's a paragraph summarizing what we've learned in this article easy enough to very naturally repeat your primary keyword in there, not having it sound like that first or look like that first horrible example that we saw. In total, you do want to keep note of your, count up your uses of your primary phrase and aim for, if possible, at least one time per 100 words. That should not be hard to do if you follow that formula. It should naturally already be in there quite a bit. But don't overdo it, not like that first example. You don't want to go more than two times per 100 words. So in a thousand word article, for example, you want to aim for about 10 uses of your primary keyword, but don't exceed 20. If you happen to be writing a shorter article and you're following this formula and you exceeded that two times per 100, back down. It's more important to not overdo it in that case. Quick, frequently asked question about question phrases. I frequently asked question about questions because I knew this was going to come up. Question phrases are a bit tricky. So if you picked as your primary keyword of a phrase that is a question, which is very common now with voice search, it's really hard to repeat that question so many times throughout the article and have it still look and sound natural. So here's what you can do. You can easily enough use it as your article title. That's pretty simple. You can also repeat it in your, in your opening section. So what can affect ovulation? That sounds perfectly natural too. But from there, you can reword it. Reword the question as an answer. And Google will understand this as, you know, that's what you're doing. You're answering the question. It will con still consider, even though it doesn't match exactly your primary keyword, it will still consider the article relevant if you just kind of restructure it so that you're answering the question. So, you know, birth control can affect ovulation, this can affect ovulation, that can affect ovulation. So that's just simply rephrasing the what can affect ovulation question into an answer. X, Y, Z can affect ovulation. That will still work. And then you can easily repeat the question in your conclusion summary. You know, so what can affect ovulation? Here's what we went over, reiterating the key takeaways. So one more time through the formula of success, step by step. When, so you start with keyword and topic selection. When writing for humans, you want to determine your few key points that you're going to make in advance so that you can break it down nicely with subtitles for skimmability. Then you want to pick your first search engines, you want to pick your right size keyword and um, make sure it's not exceeding your monthly organic traffic number. Make sure it's right sized for you. Next up in the title for humans, make it catchy using the tactics we talked about, uh, you, inserting the quantity of key points, uh, including exclusivity or urgency, identifying your audience, and using powerful words. And then for search engines, simply use your primary keyword in the title. 
Next up in your opening paragraph, for your humans, you summarize the intent of the article so they know what they're about to get out of reading this article. And for search engines, you just use your primary keyword naturally in that opening paragraph. After that, you have your quick overview of your key points. Again, to let the humans know what you're about to, a little more in depth, what you're about to go over. And for search engines, use the primary keyword in that overview subheading. Next, break down each key point with subheadings for each, for your humans. This is, you know, good, useful, genuinely helpful information about each key point of the topic. And for search engines, this is your chance to use your primary keyword naturally again and to pepper in your secondary supporting keywords at least once each. And then your conclusion subheading, repeat the intent of the article in summary format and use the primary keyword for search engines. In your conclusion paragraph for the humans, summarize, reiterate the most important key takeaways. Again, a chance for search engines so you can use your natural primary, pr use your primary keyword naturally one more time. And last but not least, I didn't touch upon this yet, but you'll always, always, always want to end with a call to action. For humans, this is pretty simple. You know, you're, you're in a business of some sort. You're, you're putting in this time and you're writing for some purpose. You want to tell the people what you want them to do. It's surprising in like conversion tracking study or conversion rate optimization studies, how effective it is to tell people what you want them to do. You think it's so you know, intuitive, like, oh, well, obviously they'll just contact me if they want my consultation. But no, you have to tell them. Next up, you need to reach out to us or whatever. And maybe you want to be a little softer and just guide them to another one of your articles so they don't simply leave. Just link to something, and this is also for search engines because search engines like internal linking. They like when they can crawl through an article and then have Google buy, you know, click on a link and go to another one. You just create a natural flow of related topics or pages within your site. So call to action effective for humans and effective for search engines when you link to another piece of content. So that's it. We actually have more time, went through really quickly. We have more time for questions than I would have thought. Um, you can also email me questions or heavy metal music suggestions at that email address there. And there's your slide link again. So first question. Okay, yeah, that is challenging. So the, the example of doing it wrong was, you know, obviously trying to go hyperlocal. Um, stop words is something I didn't touch upon that are totally okay. So if your primary keyword is like that example showed, I think it was family attorney, Plano, Texas. Um, it's totally fine to put in a stop word, which is a super short word like a and the, in order to make something more natural sounding. So, you know, you can say, such and such law firm has been a family, or so and so person has been a family law attorney in Plano, Texas for X amount of years. They opened their, you know, family attorney law services in Plano, Texas in 1970, blah, blah, blah. You know, you can put those stop words in to be able to relate, you know, a, a topic to a location and have it sound much more natural. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it did, but I mean, another thing that's interesting is kind of a key piece of advice you gave is making sure you don't bid on keywords or use keywords that are outside of your, your graphs, right? But that might not be true. It's true for hyperlocal because Google focuses on locality, and that's important to them. Right, that's true. Some of the keyword research tools let you set the location so you're not just getting nationwide search volume numbers. I don't trust the accuracy as much. It seems as if when you change it to a specific geographical region, the numbers, like you'd think they would be proportional topic-wise to if, if a certain topic is really popular, popular nationwide, it would be popular hyper-local too. I mean, obviously there's factors involved that might make that not the case, but just from what I've seen, it doesn't seem super accurate, but you can look at that data and take that into account and, and use that for your right sizing as opposed to the nationwide numbers, which is what you'll get by default. Actually, I think global is default on the keyword tool that we use. We change that to United States. And sometimes we'll check the local data, although we don't fully, fully trust it. Primarily, we use the nationwide search volume numbers. Okay. Um, it's kind of keeping the keywords 
kind of level with where you're at in the world. So how do you build your website? That, I mean, can that kind of keep you behind, or do you just kind of decide, oh, well, I'm ready to, now I can uh, Yeah. It, it, it will ramp up over time because if you start out even with super small volume keywords, 10 and 20 each, once Google starts to trust, you know, you write enough content about that, you get enough people coming to your website about that, your traffic number will naturally go up. Then you can aim for your second tier and Google will learn to trust you for those phrases and then you aim for the third tier. So it, it's not too limiting. I mean, it, it definitely requires patience. Some yeah, each time you go to write a new piece of content, check your number again. Well, I mean, if it's been a month, you know, check your number again. Um, but there is a direct relationship between quantity of new content added to the website and search traffic and rankings. It's basically, I would have included a chart, but it's just a diagonal line up like this. It's literally the more, the better. So if you start out with search volume phrases in the 10 to 20, 30s, if you, the more you write, the better. Um, because you know, that's the quicker your, your traffic will grow. So it is a strategy that takes time and patience, but if you can push out you know, articles weekly, maybe even bi-weekly, you know, the more you push out, the more it will accelerate that process. So that limit what you can write about? At first, yes. And I mean, if, you're, if you know you're gonna be going high quantity, you're gonna be writing eight blog posts a month, you can maybe you know start out with a little overconfident and pick things that are a little over where you're already at, knowing that you know you're putting so much gas in the car. That's what I say about the the quantity of new articles added. It's like putting gas in the car. So if you know you're going to be refueling twice a week, you could get you know a little aim a little higher at first. Okay. Um, what would be right size for like a new website if you have zero traffic? Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> it's it, that's a tricky one it, some if we are working with like an established business so it's a brand new website maybe a brand new domain name but they are a known business and it's not going to be hard for them to get their content linked to from reputable sources they're going to be doing PR and whatnot we may aim a little higher initially depending upon you know how big the brand is anywhere from 500 to 5,000 for a small business who's really truly unknown it's gonna take a long time yeah, conservatively, you know, in the 50s, maybe, maybe in the three digits. Some, it, this is all just rough guidelines. It, it, you know, it, you shouldn't abandon your overall marketing strategy that makes sense in order to fit into these numerical guidelines. This is just like, you know, sort of trying to stay in the same realm when you can. But if you're a small business, you're brand new, and your topic is a competitive topic, it might not be you know, possible to pick phrases that are less than 500 that describe what you do. And that's okay. Just you know, try not to go with the 50,000 search volume ones. You know, just try to stay as close as you can. It's not exact science by any means. Ah, good question. <laughs> it was, if you didn't hear it, can you accelerate the process by paying for AdWords? So there are some conspiracy theorists that believe that if you put money in Google's kitty, they will, uh, in one area, they will reward you in the other area. I have seen a correlation between that, but I don't, I'm not like the conspiracy theorist about it. I don't think it's just because you paid them. I do believe, and I've seen evidence, that driving traffic through AdWords to your content creates engagement metrics on your content and like, makes your content look popular, and that then increases your organic traction. <laughs> I have a question about the variety and like variances. So example, your H, your um, AC one, air conditioning, AC aren't just synonyms. They're right. Replacement words, right? Right. Um, do you tend to just stick to one or do you use that as a way to, to kind of like mix up the copy and, and reduce your saturation, if you will? I do try to stick with one consistently okay. if possible. So talking about different word variations like AC versus spelling out air conditioning or um, singular plural, that type of thing. Um, it's, I try to, once I make my decision, I try to stick with it throughout, unless it won't sound natural. If I have to flip something from singular to plural to make it sound natural. And is that that's, the same with the question answers? So for instance, I noticed all your snippets were like causes of whatever versus like it can, cause, can be caused by causes of like variances of that. Right. Again, I try to pick, okay. you know, if I rephrase as an answer, I try to stay consistent with the way I initially rephrase it. But if it's not going to sound natural, 
gotcha. then switch it up. Okay. Natural is, sounding natural is most important. You know, we're big believers in getting those keywords in there and how important it is to get those keywords in there, but not at the price of sounding unnatural. So just as much as you can do, as much consistency as possible, the better. Okay. Um, quick note about the looking up the search volume numbers, though, for the different word variations. That uh, depends on what tool you're using, how good they are at giving you the broad versus exact type data, you know, singular versus plural. Um, this, that's one thing about that keyword tool I've shown that I don't like is sometimes, and it's not their fault, it's because they're pulling Google's data. Sometimes Google's data rolls a singular and a plural together or a certain variation together and they give the data just for the, the one that they decided to favor. Mm -hmm. And then, it, then the keyword tool that we use will show the same numbers for each variation which is technically not true, and that bothers the data <laughs> scientist in me, but, you know, it's close enough. <laughs> How do you go about getting the content from your clients um, before you can do what you're good at? Ah, that is one of the biggest challenges of all, getting content out of clients, right? <laughs> Uh, how do you go about getting uh, the content from your clients, you know, if you're working on an agency or consultant basis? And that's what we do. We actually don't provide writing services ourselves. We either pull in an outside copywriter to work with that client or look to that client to produce their content in-house. So that is a huge challenge. Uh, planning ahead is the number one antidote to having challenges getting clients to send you content or approve content that a copywriter wrote. Uh, we plan out content calendars at least two months in advance with ideally weekly article, at least weekly articles in them. So four articles a month planned out two months in advance. We assign the, the top, or if they give us the topic, we either assign the topic or they give us the topic, but we assign the keywords and we plan that out two months in advance, get them to approve our keyword selections two months in advance, and then we try to get all the writing back to us one month in advance. So inevitably, when they delay and don't get it back to us on time, it's okay. We can still ultimately meet our content calendar deadlines. But so, so we have someone else write it. Uh, we assign the primary and secondary keywords and the internal link, and then they send it to us. We review it, make sure it was done right, and then it gets posted. Ah, that's a good question. Uh, I, honestly, I don't really, I, I have not looked into that as much when I say, so she was asking about sounding natural, if it should be like conversational, because you know you can write differently if you're writing for written text versus if you speak. Like if, if you transcribed my talking today, it wouldn't look like a very professional article. I, I haven't really looked into that too much. What I mean when I say sounding natural is just not sounding like that first example that I showed. Like, in no context, in no world does that sound reasonable. <laughs> so that's just what I mean when I say natural. I'm sorry, I haven't been looking at you. <laughs> um, you mentioned that the more frequently you add content, the better. Um, Kitty, at her talk yesterday, was mentioning that it's better to stick to a regular, consistent schedule that you can keep to as opposed to you know, updating irregular, you know, aiming too mm -hmm. high and then not being able to follow through. And not only for humans to come revisit, but also for search engines to sort of figure out how often to crawl. What do you think about that? That's a very good point. The, the cadence and the consistency is very important. I, I would also agree to go with cadence and consistency and frequency over length. So if you have to go shorter and write shorter, articles in order to keep up that cadence and frequency, I would vote for that versus okay. holding off until you can write a 1,000 or 2,000 word in-depth article. I'd still, still aim to do that once in a while. You know, if you really only have time to write a 500 word article every week, you know, try to aim for one longer post, you know, once a quarter or something. There is actually a specific algorithm for long form content, um, in-depth content. So uh, you want to take advantage of that. So you'll get certain benefits out of the frequency um, and, and cadence of the shorter posts, but you don't want to miss out on getting rewarded for having long form content too. So you know, don't sacrifice your cadence and frequency, but try to get a long one in there once in a while if you can. That's what I would say. Thank you. How do you still deal with words that are in attachments? Words that are in attachments, like a PDF? A PDF. <coughs> 
Right, okay. So PDFs, if, you, if you're linking to a PDF, you see people do this sometimes. They post their email newsletter as a PDF or as a Word file on, you know, that's linked to on, from a page on their website. Google can crawl those and it can see the keywords in them. But for some reason, it just doesn't understand them as comprehensively as it does regular website content. So, you know, it's not like it won't get indexed at all if you put a PDF or a Word doc up, but we say whenever possible, turn that into a regular old web page. Even if it's like a guideline, so something that you download onto your website, I've heard that that increases. Oh, well, so yeah, so gated content, like a, a lead magnet or something, that would be different. You, you would actually, you know, if you're trying to get them to fill out a form in order to get to the PDF, you actually want to block that PDF from search engines completely. You don't want people to just Google and find it. So you have to add uh, what's called a no index tag to that page. Be careful, just add it to that page. That is the tag of death. So if you accidentally enable that on the whole website, which, by the way, is under, in WordPress, it's under settings, discourage search, uh, settings reading, discourage search engines site will be gone from Google and Bing and every search engine. So don't enable that there. But on a page-by-page -page basis, Yoast has an option. You go to the bottom of the page, and I think it's under like the gear or advanced, whatever that section is called, and you can no-index just that page or attachment. How valuable are plugins like Yoast? Plugins like Yoast, Yoast in particular, are super valuable. Um, primarily from a technical SEO perspective, so everything we talked about today was content. There is um, two other whole buckets of SEO. There's the technical realm of things and there's the off page, like getting re reputable, relevant inbound links and stuff like that. Um, Yoast is super helpful in the technical arena. It takes care, a lot of, takes care of a lot of the technical requirements that the Google crawlers and all search engine crawlers want to see. XML site maps, little nuanced rel canonical tags and stuff. It takes care of a lot of that. I do find that the keyword um, tool calculator thing throws people off more than it helps sometimes because um, they're so focused on getting that green light. And first of all, they think that that's actually like doing SEO for them somehow by putting in that focus keyword and checking for green or red lights and all the requirements. It's not actually doing anything. And it's an automated you know, calculator checker tool of sorts to provide guidance, but it's automated. So it can't take into account unique things for that situation, like stop words if you have to use in even though your primary keyword is, doesn't have in in it, you know, it doesn't take that into account. Um, so I do find that, at least with our clients, it throws them off a lot more than we'd like it to. And it doesn't support secondary keywords in the checker part of things. So the content checker could, could use a little work, but uh, for technical, it's absolutely excellent. Yes, I should, I should say key phrase, as it can be, it should consist of multiple words. It is very difficult to go after single keyword key phrases. Typically, the volume on those is very, very, very high, except for in super niche technical situations. Like we have a client that writes about, you know, concentricity and perpendicularity. That might be a case where a single keyword is attainable. But yeah, actually, I, I should call them key phrases because most times they will have multiple words. What effect does font style like bold or wrong or italicized font? Does that have a positive or negative effect? Okay. The question was uh, font styling and how much that affects the search engine friendliness of it. Um, back in the day, bolding things did mean something, not so much anymore. But what does matter, what we still see matters, there's debate about this as with everything in the SEO community, but we do see that the tag, the heading tags that you use matter. So the specific styling on the tag doesn't matter, but there should be at least one H1 tag, like heading one, does tend to be automatically styled as the biggest, boldest, but it, that doesn't, that's not the part that matters. The part that matters is that your title is encapsulated in H1 tag, and that there's only one H1 tag on the page because from a search engine, from a designer perspective, H tags are used for styling. But from a search engine perspective, H tags are used to show importance of the subheadings. So with an H1, you're telling the search engines, this is my number one 
most important heading on the page. So if you have multiple H1 tags, you're saying this is number one and this is number one and this is, it doesn't make sense. So you want to use a logical H tag hierarchy, H1 in the title, all the other main subtitles, H2s, and if there's sub subtitles under that, H3s. That's what does matter. Ah, okay, so <laughs> hidden text, so like white, white font on white background, it responds negatively. <laughs> they, they do look down on that very much so. And Google can now crawl CSS and JavaScript. So it used to be easier to sneak by with that. At first they only stood under, bleh. at first they only understood HTML. Now, and you could get away with doing that with CSS or JavaScript. Now they, they crawl everything and they know everything now. So don't do that. What about like accordions oh, and sliders? Oh, sorry. sorry. Was, yeah. Okay. Well, you already asked. Hidden content like accordions and sliders. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a tricky one. Are you better at reading that? This, this is crossing over into, you know, advanced programming languages in, in general as a topic and how well search engines understand them. But, um, you know, content accordions or tabs or like Ajax drawers or things like that. Um, they are claiming that they know how to fully crawl that now, but they are also saying, but pre-render it for us. You know? okay. So, you know, basically they don't do a good job at, you know, I actually saw a website recently that was, the whole website was made with Angular JavaScript and it was not indexed very well <laughs> at all. So even though they claim to be making leaps and bounds in that regard and crawling and understanding that, it's the trick is to pre-render pre -render at okay. server level so that they can. And don't serve up alternate HTML versions. They used to ask you to do that. Now they don't want you to do that. Okay. Just pre-render at the server level. Oh, I'm sorry. You were next. I forgot. I'm sorry. Um, what um, podcast websites and things do you use to keep on top of all this? Okay. Um, news sources to keep on top of this. Uh, Search Engine Journal is great. Um, Matt Southern, who's the lead news writer there, actually works part-time for us as well. So we kind of cheat and get the inside source there. Um, other blogs that are good are Moz, of course. Rand Fishkin is amazing. Um, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Slosky, uh, kind of a less heard of name. Uh, his blog is at SEO by the C, S -E -A, SEO by the C dot com. He keeps uh, on top of the patents that Google's applying for. And I think there's no better way to, to keep up, not just up to date with, but ahead of the curve on where Google's going than to read about the patents they're applying for and being granted for their technology. So highly, you know, if you're really into it, I highly recommend Bill Slosky's blog, but otherwise, you know, all the big names, Search Engine Land, Search Engine Journal, Moz, they're all good. Ah, do they treat posts and pages differently? Um, not so much. I mean, especially in WordPress, the, the format, unless you customize your template to be drastically different with different heading tags and layouts and whatnot, you know, by default, they're pretty similar. So not, not from a technical perspective. I do think they understand the semantics and context of different phrases and assumes that if, I believe they assume, that if you're typing in something like, you know, marketing services or marketing agency, that you're more likely to want to read a page about those services or about that agency versus if you're typing in, you know, what can affect ovulation, you're probably looking for an article. So I do think they make those contextual differences. Schema markup is incredibly helpful. Um, all the patents they're applying for lately are indicating they're going more and more in the direction of AI and machine knowledge. So they want to actually understand the content as opposed to just match keywords from searcher to article. So they, they claim that they don't use it as a ranking factor right now, but they also claim that it's incredibly helpful to them and they want you to use it. So Gary Ellis of Google spoke at SMX in October out in New York, and I listened to his panel. And so it, it sounded a little contradictory, like we don't use it as a ranking factor, but it really helps us out, so please use it. it they're going to be grabbing, even if they technically don't use it as a ranking factor right now, anything that helps them understand your content better is helpful, and they're going to be gravitating more and more in that direction. So yeah, schema markup. If anyone doesn't know, schema markup is additional uh, code you can add behind the scenes. Uh, it's one of the only things that you can do behind the scenes in SEO that's okay. 
Um, and all three search engines, Google, Yahoo, Bing, have agreed upon this protocol, this specific protocol, schema.org, for doing so. And it adds context to the content. So you mark up individual pieces of the content, like this is the article title, this is the article body, or more helpful are the specific types of schema. Um, for example, your business address, to help Google understand where you're located geographically. You put a tag around the, um, the, the name of the company, say this is my company name. You put a different tag around the street address, this is my street address, this is my city, this is my state, this is my zip code, this is my phone number. Structured data markup is another word for it. You're, you're structuring the content into different individual tags, kind of like those heading tags I was talking about, but very specific tags so that Google can use artificial intelligence to actually know what you're talking about. So very, very, good very good thing. Like recipes. recipes, videos, products on e-commerce, huge reviews. Yeah, something for like just general articles. General articles, there is one for general articles. Authors, Authors people, bios, helping, uh, yeah, linking off to, um, you know, especially in the medical community, there's a specific uh, part of the algorithm that for medical and a couple of other fields that it looks for the credibility of the author. So you want to mark up who the author is, their bio, mark up their credentials, where they went to school, their awards, their recognition, things like that. We do have to... She's already got her hand up. I will be right out there if anyone wants to ask more questions afterwards. Ah, great question. Is it beneficial to use a common misspelling in order to rank for that? It's really hard to do that naturally. If you can do it naturally, like an article about, you know, why is blah, blah, blah word so commonly misspelled? Here's the <laughs> etymology of the word. <laughs> you know? um, if you can't do that, I, I, I would not recommend doing that. That's where AdWords might come in. You might just pay for an ad. Usually the misspellings are pretty cheap. So you might just pay for an ad on the misspelled version of the word. So we do have to close. Thank you so much. I'll be right up there for more questions. Thank you. Thank you.